Most of them have been over the summer as well, and for quite a long time. And the famous British actress Judy Dench actually said a couple of months ago that the theatres may not reopen again in her lifetime, which is a very dramatic statement to make, but then she is quite an old actress. So we're going to be discussing in this panel a number of issues about the pandemic and how it's impacted on culture and particularly cultural workers across Europe, whom we all know have a very precarious position anyway, but made even more precarious by what's been happening. And we're going to be looking at issues of funding, um, what, what is happening, how various countries are responding to the crisis in culture, um, what is going to be the long-term prognosis for many of these cultural institutions, um, some of which are having to close and some of which possibly permanently. And we will also be looking at the differences between elite culture and what we might call more popular or, or people's culture and how the pandemic has affected both and what the differences between both and how that's going to look going forward. Um, so without more ado, I'm going to introduce you to two, our two speakers. So our first speaker is Margarita Singeniotou, I hope you aren't pronouncing your name correctly, from Greece, who is um, an active trade unionist. She's an official in the main artist union in Greece and also an opera singer performing in Athens. So very pleased to welcome you, Margarita, and over to you. E each speaker, by the way, has five minutes. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, well, yes, so, I am in the do, unions, uh, and that gives me a very good idea of what's going on in the artist section. And I should be talking to you today about how our government doesn't support art, about how our government doesn't help artists uh, develop and exist in this, uh, circum under these cir circumstances. But I would like to speak about something else, uh, which um, it, it's, it's in the subject, I assure you. Well, because our minister asked uh, a question, our minister of culture has nothing to do with culture. So uh, she asked a question, is rehearsing part of the job? I mean, why do you say that you need to have contracts and stuff like that while rehearsing? Is rehearsing part of the job? Well, it is a very, very common question. Do you, you go to work when you rehearse? Well, the, the answer to that is pretty easy. Yes, it is, a, it is a part of the job because it has a schedule and I have to show up and I have to do something that we have uh, said that I would do. But there is another question that it's not so easy to answer in terms of society, in the eyes of society. Is research or practicing job, a job, work? Is it part of our jobs? I think that when we talk about art and artists and culture in general, we make a huge mistake. We think that we are different than the rest of the society. But I think that we are some kind of um, the trial uh, field of what is going to happen in society. Well, the question is rehearsing part of your job is being an artist a proper uh, profession that goes back to what we consider to be production, what we consider to be work in our society. So we are artists, we can't perform now. And uh, we, can, we can't perform because for some reason that I am going to explain, Art is the last one to open and the first one to close. Why is that? Because in the eyes of society, art is somehow um, something that is a luxury. It's not uh, like uh, going to school. It's not like going to work in terms of going to the factory and producing something, which means that when you go to the factory and produce a car, 
the car is more important to society than a work of art. That is why we can't close factories, but we can close theaters. So you see that everything that we talk about now is because we have, as societies, I mean, we have incorporated the idea that producing an, uh, an artwork is not something very important to the society than producing a car. So I think that the main um, discussion about us is how important are we to society? How important is our research? Because now that we're not open, we have a great opportunity to research about our jobs, to research about our art, and try to find new paths, try to find a new uh, connection to the society. But in order to do that, we have to have funding. And of course, if you ask for funding, for finding a drug that is good for people's souls, let's say, let's not talk about curing the cancer, but uh, let's, let's talk about something else, making people feel better. Uh, research to pharmaceutical companies about finding a pill to make society feel, feel better is uh, a self-explanatory thing. Of course, you can have funding. Can I have funding to create something to find new paths on our art? What are you talking about? This is luxury. So we see that it is an, another model of what art is about. And now that the pandemic is everywhere, we have a very, very big danger. Artists that, don't, are, that are not employees of big you know, corporations and, or state uh, scenes, state theaters, state orchestras, stuff like that, artists who have their own path and try to find their own uh, language don't uh, have, um, uh, they can survive. So what will be the society? I think that the question we should ask is not how to support people now, but why to support people now. Because if we persuade the, the, the society that we need to support artists, then we will find the way to do it. The reason why we need to support artists is that in the end of the day, after the, the pandemic, we need to have people that can tell a story about their times. I remind you that the only sources we have about historical eras is artists. People who actually told the stories of, our, of their times. And if we don't support medium artists, I mean medium, not the great, opera, uh, the, the great organizations, if we don't very well support artists that can research and find their own language and their own connection to their uh, era, we will have a big gap. And in the, in the next day after the pandemic, we will have we will just have the, uh, the kind of art that will tell the stories that the sponsors like. And I think that we all understand how dangerous this is. So uh, I think my time is up. I, uh, I need for the, um, I, I, I put this question for uh, the discussion that we're going to have afterwards. Let's form a very good reason why society needs to um, support the research and the uh, arts, the art that is going on in levels that are not just the very big ones and the very rich ones. And we'll be back. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so now I'm going to call on um, um, a friend of mine, Jose Miguel Tran, who I should say Jose Miguel to give him his correct title, uh, who is the from the Basque city of San Sebastián, Donostia, and he's the director of the Human Rights Film Festival and also involved in a lot of cinematic activities there. So over to you, Jose Miguel. Hi, hi everyone. Hello. 
Yes, I'm a, I work for a public institution, but, uh, but before talking about our position on that, I wanted to, 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 specific, to specify some details about the situation here in, in Spain. In Spain, maybe the most important activist movement in last months is named Red Alert. We make events. It's a social cultures and culture and events movement to talk about the situation of cultural workers uh, because you know venues, businessmen, women, and and to demand public measures because of restrictions. Uh, closures or at last the impossibility, the complete impossibility of, of work these days. This uh, sector, the cultural or the events uh, sector in Spain, uh, represents uh, eight point, uh, sorry, 3.8 percent of gross national product and it employs, it employs around 800,000 people in Spain. It's also a fragile sector quite fragmented. It's not, yet, uh, not just about artists, it's also uh, about technicians and other members of this chain of the, of the culture. Uh, the movement began uh, uh, in March. They got a web page, alertarrojaeventos.com. Uh, they are a lot of freelance workers without any right to public health because of their temporary jobs. Uh, more than eight months without any income uh, has been a disaster for many families. Just in the live music sector, the estimation of lows is around uh, 1,000 million euro. And after the last, the, the most recent declaration of a land situation in Spain by the government due to the second wave, these are the specific measures that they are asking for. Uh, for, for instance, one special subsidy with a, without any cost for the workers, without any other possibility, because their precariousness and lack of, lack of continuous work. Uh, the previous speaker was, was talking about that, eh? about uh, if rehearsing is, is, uh, is work or not. Uh, the prison subsidies now in Spain are really, really very low for, for the cultural workers. Also, the acknowledgement of the intermittent condition of these jobs, and consequently, they, they need these special subsidies for the periods without activity. Also, the development of one artist status or profile, including the technicians or other kind of uh, workers. Also, in the public subsidy status, put the measure to, to zero, till the recover of 100% of capacity in, in events, so the workers won't lose the right to public subsidies. Also, the postponement of sound credits in banks, for instance. And another important demand is the reactivation of cultural activities when possible, and to try not to cancel if the events have the safety guarantees. And here is where, uh, for instance, in Basque Country, uh, from June till now, uh, we worked uh, on organizing anything but with safety guarantees. For instance, in Catalonia, in the last weeks, uh, theater, cinemas have been closed, but not in the Basque Country and not in, in San Sebastian. Uh, at least we give to the sector this uh, opportunity with it concerns to the institutional agenda. Uh, from June in San Sebastian, we decided to open again our theaters to organize a different jazz festival. The Classic Music Festival, International Film Festival happened in, the, in September. Uh, all of them events with guarantees, but also a way to move this cultural economy to offer ways to artists and other workers. And we continue now on that. Uh, even with the last measures, we are working uh, on, on fin and finishing a bit sooner in the a bit sooner in the afternoon the programs, but we continue programming today during the second wave, even with the restaurants closed, uh, but we move a bit uh, the, this economy of culture. Of course, I understand that it's uh, um, much more harder for private promoters, but we can cooperate some, sometimes with them 
and the result of these months of work have been appreciated by hotels, restaurants, uh, artists. And one of the main goals uh, specifically is to work now mainly with local artists and suppliers. I, I think that it's time to pay more attention now to the, to the closer ones, to the closer one workers. Um, but we can talk about that uh, a bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josemi. So, um, so two things. I've been reminded to tell people that we do have interpretation for five languages. So if you want to speak in your own language, you're quite free to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, although both of our speakers spoke excellent English, I have to say. Um, so the other thing I should have mentioned earlier is that if you have a question to put to the panel, please put it in the Q&A and then we will take them one by one. So you'll find the Q&A at the bottom of the screen there. So if you can put your questions in there. Uh, no. Right, so Daniele, you are dealing with the Q&A, yes? Yes, um, for the moment there's just uh, one question on for the list of participants. No, there's no. And then someone, Kait Ni Kadlaik, who's uh, asking, the mention of why is very interesting. Uh, the research shows, um, as far as I'm aware, that we need an other than work. Uh, we need other things to be human. I would just like, uh, since it's a long uh, question, I would like just like to invite uh, this person to ask it directly and I will just let him or her um, in so we can see and okay. we can hear directly. So it should be in. Meanwhile, I also welcome Vincent Thirion, uh, who was trying to join us, and we can hear you, we can see you. And um, yes, so the, the participant who asked this question, uh, I see Kaitni Kadlaik. Kaitni Kaili. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's Kwaelga. Um, there was a comment, really. Hi, Joseph. Joseph's my friend. Um, what it was, was a comment I was making after listening to Marguerite, because, um, to be, it's generally what I was saying is research shows that to be human that we have to have a number of things other than just work and one of the things that they talk about or mention is that um, we should have um, arts or whatever anything that, that it is that we feel we need arts um, singing dancing pictures whatever that we need something like that to be human and at present they're talking about people in lockdown having a lot of mental health issues are likely to have them in the future and with that in mind I think it because they say one thing and do another in other words is what I'm really mentioning um, you know they say oh it's terrible this that'll happen and that'll happen and people have all these issues but when it comes to art or something like that that might actually help people in the long run or certainly help them in different ways um that as margarita says they don't give you know they're the last to get any funding so when she said why i i totally agreed with her in that sense because we need as human beings we need to have other things and as i said in the comment it generates come you know conversation uh, we're with people when we go and it brings memories for the future so in that sense uh, that's one of the reasons and psychologists also say if you read a lot of the things that's one of the things they'll say it's different ways and art is often mentioned and they use art and therapy <laughs> so you know different types of art is very necessary as human beings so I'm just agreeing with Marguerite that's all comment okay, no. No, okay. so I'll bring I, I'll bring the panel back on that in a second, but I just want to bring in Ava Brenner first from Austria, who's had her hand up. Okay. Ava. Can you hear me? Yes. No. I'm trying to uh, enter something in question and answers, but it didn't, it didn't work, so I used the chat. Um, I, I thought this was very poignant and important, Margarita, and I'm such a person. I've been working voluntarily in the so-called free alternative scene for almost uh, 30 years on and off. I've also worked in larger institutions, but I prefer to work as a free artist. And 
I'm lucky. I'm above 65. I have sort of a small pension, but the small pension reflects exactly the status of free artists. Many cannot live from their pensions and I'm still working. I'm running my company and most of my artists cannot survive. And uh, from, I think, 10 people, 12 people, two have received public funding. And it's very, it's been very difficult. And so I'm asking, what can we do? Because free artists, to put it briefly, are often very divided. They don't have a lobby. They're not united in any union. They don't have a sort of um, political consciousness of uh, 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 uniting, of um, fighting together. So how are we going to bring this class of people which is larger than most people think. I believe that most artists are not employed in large institutions and don't have access to uh, fixed employment and all the benefits. And so, so how are we going to do this? Um, I know it's a big question and you cannot answer it in a panel like this, but I just wanna put out that I see a lot of political, psychological, social, and, and also cultural uh, problems to achieve that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put those two questions to the panel. Um, Margarita, if you wanted to wait in well, first. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'll, I will start with uh, whatever uh, asked. Yes, we are not. We don't. We don't have very strong lobbies, but we have some. We we have something that the society can see us we are not invisible. That's very important. We have the strength to, first of all, we need solidarity. You know, I think, I strongly believe that uh, culture now, this particular moment, is more important than ever because now that we have this crisis and it's mostly an economical crisis, I mean, the virus will go away pretty soon, but what will be left behind to the uh, economy, or of course to labor. I mean, the, the legislation about labor uh, all over Europe is going worse and worse for the um, uh, employers. Uh, it's, we, it's going to be a massacre in society. So it is our job as artists, as cultural cultural people to say that we need more solidarity to take the uh, society to, to, to solidarity that uh, uh, then go to far right you know it's going to be um, how is it in English Kinonikos Automatismos who is translating uh, we, we are going to get one against each other that's what I mean so as artists we need to get solidarity in the front line. And this is what we can do. Because now, because we have the means, we have the music, we have the theater, we have the art to support it. So first of all, we can say why it's important to keep art in the society, because art keeps society together, keeps peace to the society. And we need to explain that to people. Second, uh, it's very important to maintain the idea that we need more to survive than work. Because if we start thinking what we don't need, we will take a path that is very, very um, strange and very, very, uh, how can I say, it's bad for society. Because if we are strong, we're part of society. If we're not, can we be part of the society? If we are not strong, if we are not healthy, if we are not rich, so who has the right to exist? And whose life matters more? I think that if we let this go, uh, we will have two kinds of people, rich people who will have access to art, a good living, good food, which is very important. And another type of per people that will be workers, that will produce wealth, but will have no access to 
uh, things that can make their life uh, affordable. I mean, affordable in a, uh, the, the sense of their souls. So it, this is our job to start the conversation and to start it in a very, you know, uh, pleasant way and to persuade people about that. Yes, Jose, may. Yeah. yeah, connected with that, uh, I wanted to add uh, that in Spain now, one of the demands is to, uh, to reclaim to the cultural sector the definition of uh, like an essential sector, a basic sector for society. So it officially, we say that it will be like, I don't know, supermarkets, uh, health or any other kind of sector. And now there are a lot of people that they are reclaiming that uh, to the government. So that is important for, uh, for consumers, if you want to say like that, but also mainly for workers, because uh, we, we, must, uh, we must remember that uh, culture is work also. It's work, it's a lot of work, I, as I told you, not just for artists, it's a lot of technicians, of people on venues, on music uh, rooms, uh, music places, uh, people who sell tickets, people uh, who make publicity, uh, marketing, uh, any kind of, uh, a lot of people, uh, print designers, I don't know, a lot of uh, jobs that you can imagine is involved with culture. And now a lot of these jobs are, uh, they are uh, disappearing in Spain. They say there are a lot of people moving from these jobs to another kind of jobs, of jobs and they are abandoning uh, the main uh, work, the main uh, studies or the main capacities or abilities because now uh, in the future it will be impossible to work, uh, to, to have work for everyone uh, because there will be less theaters, less uh, private rooms. For instance, uh, as I told you, the, the live music sector, it will disappear and this dis disappearing during uh, one year or more, uh, who knows, maybe even with the vaccine, uh, this kind of things like a, a disco, a discotheques or night bars, whatever, it's also culture, it's also amusement, but it's also culture, uh, we, we, we must not, don't for, not forget that. And also they are talking about, you know, the uh, verbenas in Spanish, like the, the musicians for local festivities, uh, it, it seems to be like a very small thing, but it's quite important here in Spain during the summer. This, uh, there are a lot of musicians, technicians that they live uh, just with the income that they got from the summer festivities in the little small villages around the, the, the state. And it's not just, uh, we were talking uh, at, at the beginning about the elite culture is not just the elite culture it's also this kind of uh, everyday culture uh, culture in the smaller uh, villages and this kind of uh, music uh, for i don't know elderly people child anywhere so there are a lot of yes invisible people but as margarita said also very visible people but maybe very visible but uh, not so uh, strong like another uh, sectors like, I don't know, automobile or uh, any other kind of, of, of workers. But this lack of unity and this, uh, this fragmentation has always been one of the, yeah, one of the, I don't know what to say, the, the mistakes or the, the yeah, it, it makes us weaker, I think. It, it makes weaker the artists and the cultural, the cultural workers, yeah. So there are two more questions, I think, in the Q&A, but I just wanted to put a question to you both quickly. And that is that this event, for example, is organized by um, the left and the trade unions and progressive forces across Europe. And traditionally, the left is seen as an ally of artists and culture and so on. So I wanted to ask you both in your respective countries, first of all, and cities, what concrete acts of assistance have the left parties given to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Margarita, yeah. 
Well, uh, we are part of the left parties as well. So I think that, um, uh, of course, if we have to talk about solidarity, if we are to talk about society, if we are to talk about how um, how we can keep the um, peace in society, the only way to go is to the left parties. So basically, what happened is Greek in Greece is this: uh, we have a very alt-right government, and of course, they don't think that culture uh, that that artists are something that we need to uh, talk about. Uh, but the the reason that we have is that now most of the society knows that we should support art is just because the unions and the left parties, Syriza in, uh, in particular, that is the biggest uh, party of uh, the left uh, wing in, uh, and it's the second party in Greece, they have uh, supported this idea of artists being very uh, important, but to, not to the, the, the elite art, exactly what Yasmin said, that we need of course, elite art is something that doesn't need our help. And the left-wing parties do this for everybody and for artists as well, because, you know, I don't, I don't want artists to be something different. We are what everybody else is. I mean, we are a part of the society. Art is a part of the society. They're not some strange people doing gorgeous jobs that since they are having so much fun while they work, they shouldn't be paid in the first place. So we have to, 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 to say that um, it's what keeps society together. And left, le left parties really uh, go with this uh, idea and they support it to public speaking. And that's why we're talking now to this group of people and not some other group that wouldn't listen to us. So just to give us the opportunity to talk about these things and now it's more important than ever to talk again about the, uh, the need of having public health, public education, uh, s support artists in not, not the elite way, but support creativity and create the circumstances for peace in the society. Only left can do that. Okay, uh, in the case of, of Spain, you know that uh, for many, many years, uh, especially right parties, uh, and, and when they are in government uh, more uh, stronger, uh, they have created a, a sort of a bad image about uh, the cultural workers, or especially uh, concerning cinema. Do you remember the, the complaints and the demands of cinema workers, actors, directors in the Goya prices in Spain? And the, the right parties always said that uh, they are very rich people complaining about things like, I don't know, uh, uh, left uh, wing causes like Sahara or ecology or these kind of things, and they create this sort of uh, depreciation or the sort of bad image of the of the culture. And it, it's true that uh, for many many years uh, they almost succeed on that, and they succeed uh, on in one part of the society with this bad image that is not very helpful now for the real demands of these cultural workers that could be not just Almodovar, could be any kind of technician in a, a small uh, music room or could be any kind of a uh, popular musician. So uh, I don't know if even, and is, I know that it's a bit of criticism, but I think that even in, in parties like uh, Podemos, who is today in the, in the government, uh, sometimes they don't pay the real attention to this cultural system because even in some cases they, they got this idea of the cultural workers like a elite, intellectual elite, but also economical elite of people. 
and it's not real because uh, it's just a, a very small percentage of, of cultural workers that they got a big income during the whole year. But it is not the majority of, of cultural workers that they work for many, many years during the, the entire lives. And at least when they retire, they got a very small pension or very, uh, on, uh, or even they don't have any right to subsidy. So I think that they also in, in left parties, they, they, they should pay more attention uh, to that and they should uh, work more uh, with these demands, like I say in my, in my first, uh, in my first speaking, this threat alert or we make events movement than uh, some people connected with uh, the, the Podemos or another kind of thing, but it's not the same. It's not a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a movement apart. It's a mixed of different, uh, different ideologies also, I think. So uh, I think that culture in Spain maybe is similar in that uh, to Greece. Uh, it's not in the, in the top of, of, of the, of the ranking of the uh, worries of people, of uh, ordinary people. Maybe they, they think uh, they like, uh, I don't know, American movies and all this kind of thing, but our own culture in, is not in our ranking of, of worries. Maybe soccer or football or another kind of things are more popular than that. Yeah, thank you. That's an important point you made about most cultural workers actually being members of the precariat, yeah. which is a growing, growing class across Europe. Um, Daniela, I think we have one or two questions in the Q&A. Indeed. I cannot find in the participant list the first uh, person who asked a question, so we'll jump to the second, which is our uh, friend Merichel. I let her in already. Um, do you want to ask your question directly? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much and congratulations to all the panelists. Um, my question is, uh, this COVID crisis has made evident the, this precarity, this fragility of the cultural system and mainly for cultural workers and, and enterprises. Um, in my opinion, it's just uh, um, something that this crisis has accelerated and the problem probably is, is more structural. So I, on the other hand, this COVID crisis has also made evident that uh, culture is necessary for people, uh, for mental health and mainly in these situations of isolation. Um, for our welfare, it's, it has been something that is more than needed culture. And um, so, Putting a little bit all the all these thoughts together, I would like to ask uh, if each panelist could bring um, or name which main uh, policies or issues should be taken into account to overcome this structural uh, fragility of the cultural system to to make a more strength uh, cultural system and so a society more aware of the importance of the culture. I know it's a very broad question, but just name each panelist one or two main issues. I think it would help. Thank you. Do you want to begin this time, Hasemi? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as we told, uh, main, uh, the majority of workers in in the culture they are temporary workers. They are freelance workers. They or they got this intermittent condition of, of their jobs. So I think the the one of the main uh, measures could be uh, first to educate the public uh, work system in each government about this kind of works because when you go to a public office or when you go to a, win a window of a bureaucrat, they don't know where to put your job in, the, in their system. They don't know. They don't know where, where that you, you are a photograph, you are a musician, you are a singer, you are a technician, and they put you in a, I don't know, in one, another thing, in, a, in one uh, diverse or uh, something that they don't, they don't have this definition of cultural workers or they don't have this profile to this kind of jobs. 
So I think that is very urgent and, and, and that is a thing that the left parties uh, uh, should, uh, should go for. Uh, it's a very urgent to, to, to change a bit the, the work system and to, to try to define uh, better this kind of jobs uh, with these uh, special subsidies and with this uh, special consideration like uh, the rehearsing you were talking Margarita about that the rehearsing is also to work and you and also that if uh, maybe when you are working for an institution you can go by a contract uh, you don't have to be a freelancer you don't have to pay more taxes for that you ma you should be contracted by now in cinema in, in the industry of cinema is necessary to, to, to have a contract to go into a movie in, in the better cases. But uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, precarity uh, can, can be changes and can be changed and can be changed, should be changed by the, by the governments and by this kind of, of measures uh, that pay more, more attention to the specificity of these workers. Margarita. Well, in 1989, I went to Hungary and um, attended the summer course of, of uh, Kodai Academy, which was a very demanding program. And we uh, covered some material of what the, the music they did back then in elementary school. And it was pretty demanding elementary schools, right? And I was 18. So uh, I asked, why is it so demanding? I mean, it's just elementary school. Why are you, um, wh why is it so hard? Are you making everybody should be a professional musician? And they said, we don't train, train them to be musicians. We train them to be the audience. I think that the society knows that culture is art is important when they're a part of it, when they can somehow produce it, when they have it in their everyday life, when we, they can go every summer, every Sunday to a choir and um, sing Bach, when they can join a course and paint something, they don't have to be real artists, I mean, cutting edge and putting new things in, uh, in on the table. But I think that the first thing we should do now, now, I mean, tomorrow, today, to persuade society that culture is important is to uh, have it in schools, to have it in small places, give real money to make small, uh, in every small town, make some, you, you know, uh, culture events that can be produced from the society, about the society. That's the only way to make people believe that this is work happening, worth happening. And when they do, then the artist that has something more to say, more, you know, more, I mean, um, in a, in a way more um, calculated, more uh, professional, then it will be like eating a very uh, nice cooked meal. I mean, we eat, we eat every day so we can understand why we need chefs. We produce art every day so we can understand why we need artists. That's the only way. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. A very interesting metaphor there that will stick in my memory. <laughs> it's um, food for our, for food for soul. <laughs> Daniele, are we able to bring Jean-Pierre in yet? Um, we can try again. Let's see if we can, uh, if we, we can hear him. Jean-Pierre. Non. No. On te voit mais on t'entend pas. So, so we hear you but we can't. Malheureusement pas. 
We see you. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Sorry for that, Jean-Pierre. Now I'll, I'll keep trying to see if we solve the problem with Jean-Pierre. Roberto wanted to ask a question. And I, I see that time flies. So... Yeah, I, I think that Vincent had a question before. So I need to bring Vincent in first. Ah, yeah, I didn't see it. Sorry. Hey. Well, thank you. It's not really a question, but since uh, Jean-Pierre uh, cannot speak and he already had a, a problem uh, two days ago at another meeting, so but he's very active. You cannot hear him, but he's very active. So he does a lot for culture in the city of La Louvière. You know. La Louvière is a particular re is a city in a particular region in Belgium. From a social and economic viewpoint, it's very weak, it's poor, it's a bit like Manchester, if you see what I think. And COVID has a specificity in Belgium, as for many examples I heard. So for the, the first communication from the government did not even speak about culture. They did not even mention the word culture. So little by little, the small artists have got together and we said that Belgium is a country with 11 million people and culture represents 50 billion euros of turnover and 250,000 people, not 250,000 people who have nothing to eat, but still people facing difficulties. So we had to fight to explain this to the government. So far, French-speaking party, because we know that in Belgium we have six governments, three ministers for culture, but for our minister, who's a green, is rather on the left, many things have been done until today to actually face the COVID crisis. And in the city of La Luvière, I'm in charge of a cultural center, which is subsidized. We could not open, and we decided to host 17 companies, to fund all the artists in this. And uh, it's a, a way, to, to, way to, to, to go and find a solution to help other people, you know, and work with the local TV and so on. And so, so do local activities. And I heard a question about education. It's very important. The city of La Louvière has a lot of young people. The average age is very low somehow, so we work a lot with schools, for example, uh, regardless of what they teach, you know, public schools, Catholic schools too. We create workshops with them and uh, we have a creative center also. And thanks to practice, we try to make sure that young people are more interested in uh, cultural work, that's it. So these are examples of things we do now. Now, on a daily basis, we're facing a huge inequality, huge inequalities with all our uh, uh, sectors. People actually starve to death now in the sector in Belgium. Yeah, I just want to uh, say that now we hear all the languages at the same time. I don't know if it's a mistake with the system or with my system, but it just started five minutes ago, so it's hard to hear anything at all. I just want to mention that. I have to say, I, I was hearing him fine. I mean, oh, I heard the English and the French, everything at the same time. Yes, I can uh, suggest you, as uh, Judith is writing in the chat, that you should mute the original audio in the options of the interpretation. There's a little button when you choose the English channel. There's also the option to uh, mute the original audio, so you will not hear the oh, French. Okay. Or I, co I couldn't case. do that, Daniel. I couldn't do that. I tried to, but it didn't mute. So I just heard with my lousy French what yeah. <laughs> Vincent said. I can help you in private to, okay, to set it up. You. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's working now. Let's try. I saw I saw the button. It's all the way on the on the bottom. Okay, Vincent, can you wind up, please? Écoutez, je pense que d'abord c'est la première fois que je participe. All right. Well, it's the first time I'm attending such a broad debate with so many representatives. 
and uh, I don't know how we can uh, stick together and show the, the way to go, you know, walk the talk and show the leadership what we need to do, because it's time that Europe comes to life, naturally like, to life, but also cultural life is important, you know. Have all these people, you are from so many different countries across Europe. We are all facing difficulties. We are all facing specific difficulties, but somehow we can help each other because there are uh, there is a common basis. And uh, so Europe hardly exists for us. So it does not exist almost. So we could become the stakeholders of the Europe of the future, tomorrow's Europe, but it should not be for tomorrow. We have to do it today to make sure that culture improves in all our countries. Belgium has something wonderful. Belgium has in its population <laughs> Vincent, we around have around 140 have people and nationalities. So we are a destination country for migrants. We are lucky that we can work with people from many countries and culture should show the example. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. So um, we are coming to the end of our time. I understand there is another question in the Q&A, Daniele, from Constanza. Yes. Uh, let me... She should be in now and she should be uh, ready to ask it live. Constance? We can see you, but we cannot hear you. Yes. Uh, now, now it's functioning, yes? Yeah. Yes, uh, my question was very easy. Uh, the European Parliament demands in uh, its resolution uh, on cultural recovery, uh, it was adopted on the 14th of September, uh, to use 2% uh, of all EU COVID-19 recovery funds for the cultural sector. Yes, a resolution is a resolution. It's not a big step. It's a demand to the commission and to the other co-legislator, the council. But um, in, after this resolution, the small budget of the Creative Europe for the next seven years uh, switched from 1.6 uh, billion to 2.2 billion. A little bit was happened. It was interesting. But I think when all the um, um, EU um, funds, um, recovery funds implemented in the, in the member states, all cultural workers can use this demand. All unions, they really work together with uh, um, cultural workers, can use this demand. And so I think we also can support this demand of the European Parliament to use 2%, it's not much, I know, because uh, uh, the whole uh, cultural sector uh, produced um, more than 3.4% uh, of the GDP of Europe and, and have, uh, like uh, the Spain colleague said, it's, uh, uh, we have 7.5 million uh, uh, workers uh, European-wide in the sector, more than uh, car industry, more than industry of foods and so on. A lot of people don't know this. But we can use this uh, demand also in our uh, um, um, statement and in, in the statement of the assembly, and we bring it in the member states. I think it would be a good idea. How do you think as panelists on this? <laughs> yeah, this was my question. Yes, Margarita, do you want to respond to that first? I think that it is, um, uh, the problem with us artists is that we're very rarely organized. And what Costanza said is very, very important that we can use everything, the weapons we have, everything we can, uh, we can get our hands uh, on uh, in parliaments, state parliaments, I mean, the, our country's parliament and the European parliament. So I think that, but, but I think that should be the um, uh, one uh, organization starting this. And I think that uh, maybe this group of people would have this forum, would have an idea of how to form um, you know, a, a, a 
something that will show that we need uh, the, the European Parliament to take some action on that. I, I, I think it would be a great idea and I would be uh, happy to help in any step. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a good idea. Why not? I would, I would sign that. I would sign that absolutely. And any, any kind of percentage that could be, could be applied with these fundings now, they are, they are talking that the European fundings, they uh, mainly they will dedicate to things like digi digitalizations. Uh, I think that the economy, ecological economy or something like that. But the, now the governments here, for instance, in Spain, some uh, local governments, they are talking about any other kind of projects like the roads or I don't know, uh, the, the usual, usual projects that, uh, that goes uh, mainly for uh, any other kind of, of works. More, uh, more buildings, more construction, more things like that. So I think that 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 we should uh, we should support this idea, or maybe uh, apply or uh, getting more fundings for our minds that uh, also that for our, our minds and the work that uh, built our minds more than the works that build the buildings and the roads and this kind of big projects that usually uh, goes to the, the money, this money go to the pocket of the politicians. So we should apply for that more, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you everybody for what's been a very interesting debate. We've come to the end of our first session. I'd like to thank both of our speakers, Margarita and Hosemi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll now um, here. We have, yeah. So I will hand you over to Daniele, who will explain um, what happens next. Okay. Oui, merci. Uh, je vais parler en français. C'est plus facile. All right. Thank you. It's easier for me. Well, thank you, everyone. I would like to thank all the speakers and the people who spoke. Uh, I will now move on with the next part of our event. I'll now show you the video contribution of Pierre Bragard. He's a writer, a small publisher, who shares his reflection, his passion about culture. Culture is an essential sector, he claims. And then I will give the floor to Paolo I'll all be our moderator for the next panel. So bear with me just a second, I'll share the video. Bonjour, je m'appelle Pierre Bragard, je suis... I am Pierre Bragard, in charge of the Audace uh, Publishing House. It's a small structure. It's a non-profit, actually, and we're not part of the uh, uh, quite exclusive and complicated market, which is made up of big publishing houses. So uh, my uh, structure initially aimed at uh, publishing books that are liked, things that I very much enjoyed uh, about literature, theater, uh, uh, local uh, works also and little by little when books became more important and uh, we organized meetings with the readers and I understood that books were much more important to me because books generated meetings between people so sometimes people ask me if culture is important I said, yes of course it is and, and undoubtedly, then there's an exchange uh, between the author, the writer, the readers, the publishers, and everything about uh, books, uh, generally speaking. It is important. It is essential for people to meet. It is what allows us to exchange ideas, to debate about what we think is true or not true, and debate about so many things that require uh, more uh, explanations because we're facing a lot of aggressiveness in the, on social media, 
uh, we see more extreme extreme uh, movements, radical movements, uh, especially among some politicians. And so I truly believe that this uh, area of freedom, this space of freedom is now essential. It is essential and uh, we have to support it. We have to support it to fight this uh, uh, single uh, concept of finance, of uh, education, culture that we are facing. So we're, we face uh, aggressiveness in society and we'd like to, to, to face that and uh, improve that. So it's about meeting, it's about sharing ideas and that's the message I'd like to send across as far as I can, as much as I can. Thank you. Voilà, merci. Uh, je vois well, que... Thank you for that. Maybe we'll try give it a try again with Jean-Pierre to see if he can join us. Otherwise, we'll give the floor to Paolo. Jean-Pierre, could you try to speak to us? No. All right. We hear you, but you're so far away. That's really too far away. Sorry for that, Jean-Pierre. Hardly, hardly hear your voice. So we'll hear the floor directly to Paolo. So sorry for that, Jean-Pierre. Sorry, everyone. alla prosecuzione di questa riunione il nostro tema è Hi everyone so we'd like to thank you welcome to this part of uh, this next part of the round table here we are going to speak about Europe and culture no Europe without culture we'll uh, give the floor to Serge Rogour who will attend, uh, is an emeritus professor at the University of Toulouse in France. So I would like to say two things. Europe is not a nation. It's not about a people. So Europe, it's something different. And we had to fight wars for hundreds of years in Europe. And Europe was created with a purpose. Uh, it was only created when we set an idea for the concept. So, it was uh, created when we were freed from Nazism and fascism. This is when we created this concept of Europe, a Europe where people live in peace. And in the recent years, we started wars again, wars between people because of nationalism. Those who say that there's no Europe without culture mean that Europe cannot exist if we don't have a, a larger concept of what Europe is. This includes uh, freedom and justice. So we need a bigger idea of what Europe can look like. It, the, the European dream, like the American would call it. So Europe would not work, will not work without that. And so culture now is, um, well, the, the fundamentals for Europe and it gives Europe the possibility to exist. I will now give the floor to Serge Rogour who will make a presentation and then we have a debate. Serge, you have the floor. The floor. On m'entend pas? Oui, maintenant oui. All right, thank you. Thank you, I would like to contribute to the ongoing debate and speak about the relationship between culture and Europe. It was said already today, culture is important. It is fundamental and we all agree, it's so obvious. Now, did we see culture as such when we created the EU? So Europe is a reality, it's a geographic reality. And what we're interested in here is the EU. The EU is an organization which is a political organization and it, it sets standards actually. So today we're speaking of Europe, that's the EU, but does the EU think that culture is fundamental? Well, historically speaking, the answer is no. 
would like to remind you that the Treaty of Rome, which was at the, the basics of the EU in 1957, it was the ECC, European Economic and Culture. There's nothing about culture. Culture was completely forgotten. And then in 1986, there's still not a single word about culture. And what happened is what was the economic and uh, economic community of Europe. It was a, a rationale of market that they used. They decided to provide freedom of services. It's a mercantile approach. It's a commercial approach. And they really ignore culture. It's all about everything but culture. Jean Monnet, one of the fathers of the EU, knows what he said. Uh, he, he never really said it, actually, but years later, he said that if we had to start it all over again, well, in Europe, to build something, we should start with culture. And he admitted this, it's so big, it's important. Culture enters the EU law with the Treaty of Maastricht. I will not start legal uh, cases uh, here, but uh, I would like you to understand that we need to understand the status of culture at the EU institutions. What do they think about culture? Well, they just give a derogation every time for culture. So their fundamental principle is liberal. It's about freedom of services, freedom of movement of services, merchandise, goods, capitals, and people or persons. But culture, and you have to understand that from a legal viewpoint, culture is only enjoying a derogation. I'll give you an example. Yeah, I'll, you'll understand why I'm taking this example. That's one of the audiovisual public services, like television and in France, like in other member states. It is the first cultural practice. Well, many people for economic, social, uh, and territorial conditions cannot go to the opera, to the theater, and they watch TV. Actually, television cannot get public money. It can only get public money in, only in the framework of a derogation to provide specific missions specific missions that other private operators do not provide. And the amount of the funding, uh, the fee that they, they call it in some countries, the fee should be proportionate. It means that it all depends on preset conditions. We have to keep this in mind. And this is valid for all types of subsidies when it comes to supporting culture. Now you may know that there's a specific legal mechanism that prohibits, according to the EU law, state aid, where state aid means public funding of all types, including in the cultural sector. But then you foresee derogations because we believe that culture sometimes is a matter of general interest, a highly necessary matter, and sometimes they say that we have to set aside the purely rational, uh, the, the pure mercantile and economic rationale. And we have to focus on what matters most. So the question is, what should we do today? Now, well, I was an expert for the French government during the negotiation of the treaties on the, the culture uh, and uh, exception. Uh, the diversity of culture. The, cu the current concept of making an exception for culture is wrong. How could you imagine that we're in liberal society where everything is free and according to market rules, everything would be privatized except culture. That would be the cultural exception. This is not sustainable. So my conclusion is if, if we want culture to become a priority, and in the French case, we have many arguments that we like to bring forward. We have to think that we're facing fundamental activities of general interest. In France, we said it's part of the public service, actually. 
then we should ask ourselves a question. So that's the status of public services according to the European law. So these are general economic interest services in EU jargon. So this would uh, enable us to escape from competition rules and pure liberalism or free market and so on. But the EU never wanted to define the status of public services. Many speakers said it before. And today, of course, it, it all deals with health issues, but also we should cover culture, cultural issues. Now, what about the pandemic and all this? Well, in most, in most member states, but especially in France, why did we stop all such activities, including cultural activities? We closed bookshops, cinemas, theaters, and so on, and so on. Why? Well, we fear that public hospitals would be overwhelmed because we cannot actually stop the pandemic. But in France, if you take official figures from the Ministry of Health, in 15 years, from 2003 to 2017, the, the, the various governments, left and right wing, they have reduced uh, the number of beds in public hospitals in France by 69,000 units. And people in the field of culture are not directly interested in what it could cause in the cultural sector. So today there's a health crisis and we understand the dramatic consequences of the health crisis, including for the cultural sector, for different activities, for many professionals and so on and so on. So we need to understand the situation from a political viewpoint. We know that Europe was built on purely liberal bases on a mercantile approach and culture is seen as nothing. And for my part, I fully disagree. When you say like 2% of the emergency fund. Like, yeah, well, that's charity. That's giving us something that's better than nothing. But come on, the cultural sector deserves more, more than just 2% of this emergency fund. So it's a highly political matter. This question should be about culture, culture should be essential, and to make it essential, you need to fight to make sure that public funding becomes legal, to make sure that we organize public services, and we should believe and say that Europe should no longer be purely liberal and mercantile. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I spoke too long. Absolutamente no. Grazie, Serge. <laughs> la, la, no, no, sa, va molto bene. Absolutely not. You've not been long at all. Thank you, Serge, and thank you very much for what you said. Uh, culture has to be uh, indeed uh, considered as an essential good. Uh, I will now open the debate. Who wants to uh, take the floor, please? Roberto, chiede la parola. Roberto. Roberto Grazie, Morena, mi sentite, spero. E, I hope you can hear me. Thank you e, no, Io eh, condivido oh, molto eh, questa idea um, che eh, I share the, la suggestione the, che Paolo all'inizio ci faceva, the ideas, eh, cioè che eh, uh, in realtà eh, l'Europa uh, come entità uh, culturale uh, eh, today, non indeed, esiste come unità. I think Europe eh, però è anche vero che l'Europa ha rappresentato uh, un punto di riferimento cultural, anche culturale uh, eh, in being, molti aspetti uh, come no sistema sociale, as, uh, eh, lo ricordava Paolo, eh, grazie and alla lotta al nazifascismo Europe abbiamo has, costruito delle società in cui you know, has, eh, uh, quelli che appunto Serge ci ricordava essere lo spazio pubblico then, uh, era uh, definito e riconosciuto. E, e condivido l'idea uh, della trasformazione e la costruzione dell'unità uh, dell'Europa dell Unita, così come la conosciamo, is, ha delle fondamenta uh, need, evidentemente I mean, neoliberali, interiste, e, e si basano appunto sullo scambio di mercato. Eh, però quello che dobbiamo anche capire è che non è vero che uh, l'Europa non fa cultura. 
e la cultura del mercato è esattamente una cultura è la cultura opposta eh, a quella che è, diciamo come definita la, la lotta di classe rovesciata no? eh, noi abbiamo assistito eh, in questi ultimi anni in questi ultimi decenni a una violenta eh, distruzione della, di, di, della cultura decades, del bene pubblico I think we have e, e della trasformazione degli strumenti good, eh, culturali uh, uh, in eh, forme di colonizzazione del pensiero tools, neoliberale. Uh, in Italia eh, i programmi televisivi eh, sono And, uh, il 90% Italy, americani Uh, e con we, uh, uh, cliniche, uh, con poliziotti, con uh, paura, con la creazione della paura del, del nemico, del diverso, uh, 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 questo, uh, questa cultura ha invaso, uh, credo, il continente, uh, che parla da, dal nostro punto di vista in Italia, è così, um, I mean, it sort of creates a credo che invece è una battaglia per ridare, come diceva Sergio, un ruolo alla uh, televisione pubblica e quindi creare search, delle forme uh, di eh, rappresentazione di quella de said, cultura democratica public, uh, che invece l'Europa ha costruito eh, nei, nei secoli attraverso, questo, come diceva Paolo giustamente, attraverso uh, lotte, uh, battaglie, uh, guerre e uh, è essenziale per uh, definire uh, la sopravvivenza uh, dell'Europa stessa e della sua cultura uh, if we want, uh, e credo che sia anche importante perché consente a milioni di persone, come ho detto hand, prima, di continuare a lavorare that, su questo eh, spazio, su uh, questo terreno e consente anche un punto di vista alternativo to, uh, e necessario e importante. Continue, uh, questo mi sembra importante che il forum uh, promuova uh, anche iniziative a livello europeo per, to, uh, per raggiare centralità al servizio pubblico televisivo e offrire un canale anche di, eh, di utilizzo da parte di, said, uh, delle forme di, a, eh, uh, di cultura dal basso, diciamo public, uh, cultura TV alternativa and public, uh, per poter utilizzare uh, questi canali di televisione, quindi so that culture starts anche from the grassroots. Per, uh, and per we dire. can use uh, TV to do that. Uh, and I think TV is a good way to do that, to not only share culture, but also generate uh, uh, income uh, for maybe other aspects and activities of the culture. Eva has asked for the floor. Me? Yeah. I'm muted, I think. Yeah, I want I want to pick up on what Roberto said, although I still hear two languages at the same time, but I, I can endure it uh, for the for this assembly. Uh, I see all, I mean, maybe I'm being too general or too superficial, but I see all of these issues somehow connected. The exposure of the precariousness of, of cultural workers in the COVID period, the disrespect for culture that's expressed by our governments, which has always been there, but now it's become visible or more visible and sort of the neglect or almost amnesia of the tradition of left culture. So our little video, which we'll see uh, later after this debate, has to do with the attempt to reappropriate some of this left cultural tradition, which the, particularly the young are not connected to anymore. And if you look at this sort of political theater of the 20s and 30s, for example, and there are many other examples, particularly in Italy, Uh, that Roberto knows much better than me, uh, connected and coming out of the base. This was not an elite culture. It came from the sources of the people and it entered the canon of, in this case, uh, theater tradition. So my question to uh, some of the left thinkers of the L present here is, how are we going to not just 
pay for artists and make clear that artists work and that this work has to be paid and that it's not a gift. Uh, sometimes these subsidies we get are treated as if they were gifts and sometimes they give it, then they don't give it, then they withdraw it, then they reduce it. And, and, and that's already a no-go. So how can we also reconnect to this enormous left cultural tradition, particularly for the young people? Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. I'd like to give the floor, or before I give the floor to Roberto. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, listen to the language uh, that corresponds to the language you speak, or there may be this uh, overlap. Uh, so I hope this also speak the language that you listen to and listen to the language that you speak. And I want to give the floor now to Norberto, or Roberto, sorry. Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, here anymore. I'll give the floor to Steve Freeman. Can we give the floor to Steve Freeman, please? Okay, I'll give the floor to Steve then. Sorry for the... Oh, sorry, Hello. sorry, sorry about that. that. I didn't realize that you were calling me in. Um, my question was um, to do with the idea that if, if we look at British culture, British culture wasn't really created until the 18th century because we didn't have Britain before then. It was, it was, it was the outcome of, a, of, of the 17th century revolution that created Britain and with it British imperialism. So there's a very close connection between uh, cultural ideas and the state. So in a way, is there such a thing as a European culture if we don't really have a European state? In other words, we have to transform the European state to as part of the process of getting a European culture. I mean, there's a, a European culture in the sense that each nation within Europe has its own national culture. But is there such a, can we have a European culture and can we have a European democracy or if you like a pan-European democracy and a pan-European culture? And in the terms of British culture, there's the, the culture of the ruling class. We were saying rule Britannia, Britannia rules the ways. And then there is the culture of the people, which is actually a rebellious culture, the culture of struggle against the ruling class. So again, in European culture, what is the popular revolutionary democratic culture, if you like, as opposed to the culture of the European elites. So I, I just want to see how, how the, my question is around that is can, can we have a European culture without having a European pan-European democracy? And I think the two things go together. That's it. Thank you, Steve. I am uh, looking at my screen. Uh, Norberto, who wanted to take the floor, apparently is back. So I'll give him the floor now. Please go ahead. Still not there? OK, so he's not there. OK, then uh, Serge wanted to uh, respond to the question. So I'll give you the floor, Serge, and then I think we can have a few, uh, we've got a few more minutes for another round of questions. Serge. And Serge's microphone is muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You hear me? We do. Yes. Thank you very much. I want to, to uh, well, react to Steve, Steve's question and, and say two things. Okay, one, culture is a competence of member states right now. So culture is not a competence of the European Union. So we've got, as you know, the principle of subsidiarity. 
uh, the European Union can uh, take decisions and uh, adopt directives and launch uh, the media program, for example. Okay, but it's still down to uh, member states that uh, uh, the responsibility will be found in terms of, of culture. Now, to answer your question, uh, I don't think it's going to be because or when we have a sort of European state uh, that, that will have a European culture. And I think if we end up with a situation where uh, competencies in the field of culture are given away from by member states to this sort of European state. I don't think that will guarantee better uh, cultural policies or programs. So I don't, at, at least in the current situation and context, I don't think that uh, uh, moving that way would be a, a, a real solution. I want to say that from the very beginning in the European Constitution, the founding fathers of Europe. Uh, voluntarily opted for the market as a driving force behind or you know underlying the, the building uh, of uh, of Europe they thought states member states are always going to think about themselves first and have a nationalist vision and that is why they decided let's substitute what we have a sort of addition of small markets and transform that into a single market and that is how they thought Europe would be built at the time uh, you know for so some years ago public services uh, and public uh, cultural services including TV uh, was based on national monopolies uh, including in the UK but then gradually through liberalization and privatization we have seen that uh, the EU has somehow uh, put in place this market uh, approach to culture and particularly to TV. So I think what is essential today is that artists, those who create the professionals of culture and artistic creations, they have to be politically aware of how Europe is working and operating. Because as far as France is concerned, I haven't said much about France, but I think there is a total, a very a massive misunderstanding and, and lack of awareness about how Europe actually works. Once we have achieved that, and once creators and artists are aware of what they face, then we can start fighting and putting up some sort of uh, ring fencing system to protect what I called the services of general interest. We've never had a list of those, by the way. We need a list of those services of general interest. Hopefully in that list, there will be culture. And that means we can then free culture from this uh, free market rationale. And we have this so-called uh, cultural exception. That will mean we liberalize, but we can't liberalize everything and culture should be out of uh, uh, those sectors that, that can be liberalized because indeed, you can't just, uh, I would say, limit culture to a, a supply and demand relationship. Culture is something else. Culture is not car making or, or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. No, do we have more questions, please? Any other question, please? Any other comments? Um, Joseph uh, earlier uh, talked interestingly about this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, interconnection and uh, uh, of, of cultural, sorry, uh, of, of elite culture versus popular culture and is sort of shifting around. Now, what I want to say is that to me, quickly, culture is, is two things to me. First, it is what Serge uh, described. I think indeed, as he said, culture has to be something that we consider uh, as, as out of market 
uh, forces and market rationales and not just because we give it some sort of uh, status which would be yes uh, uh, status of, of an exceptional service that is away from market forces and take a note of the market but also because uh, well de facto there are things that are so essential that we need to save them from the supply and demand rationale and this is true for the health sector and certainly also for uh, the cultural sector and i think that we can and we should extract culture from uh, the market rationale or save it from the market rationale. But then there's something else, uh, which is about, I would say, the format that is proposed by European institutions. The European treaties are pushing indeed uh, for this uh, market approach it's based on uh, competition open competition uh, uh, and uh, it is seen competition as a sort of main pillar of the life of, of europe and i think somehow we should ask for cultures to be taken out of the scope of the treaties i don't know uh, if, if if you know that makes sense but there is no sense and no, um, in, in my opinion, no uh, value in uh, positioning culture within the market and creating competition between cultural actors, uh, just like it is nonsensical to create a sort of competition between individuals. So yes, let's save culture uh, from uh, the market forces. And it's a little bit what uh, the example of TV that was given by uh, Roberto earlier. I think, yes, culture has to be seen as a common good. We need to fight and hopefully uh, demonstrate that Europe can only exist if we have this sort of, of glue that is cooperation and not competition uh, between, you know, all the members, uh, uh, member uh, states of Europe and, and people of Europe. And then I'll conclude uh, by saying this, with the COVID-19 crisis, I think we have somehow seen new um, spaces uh, that have become visible, spaces that we can invest uh, I think the COVID-19 crisis is showing us that some doors uh, are now open. Of course, the right-wing forces are trying to use them. So, but I think we need to uh, take you know, stock of what is happening, uh, look at the reality today, see that this crisis is showing us maybe that we need to move away from the past uh, and, and, and go towards something else. And we need to exploit, in the positive sense of the term, this extremely hard times that we are going through. It's a little bit like after the Second World War. Uh, you know, after the Second World War, we come, came up with this idea that we needed Europe, we needed cooperation, uh, and that would be how we avoid uh, another war. Well, after COVID-19, I think maybe we have to show that we need to build a different Europe based on solidarity and, and togetherness. And maybe this is an idea that now is, is possibly uh, something that people can hear more than in the past. And maybe this is something that, that, that yes, can be heard. Now, that's all I'm going to say myself. And I'm, again, asking the audience if anybody wants to take the floor, please do so. Joseph, maybe? Yes, I just wanted to respond to one or two points. So, um, yes, I did make the point earlier about popular culture and how we define popular culture, making the point that opera was at one point, certainly in the 18th and 19th centuries, a very popular art form. In fact, I've just, just been a documentary on BBC radio um, about operas and it described how when Carmen first came to 
England in the early 19th century, it was hugely popular. Nothing like this had ever been seen. It was the Lion King of its day and it toured. They, they put on performances in Manchester, which at the time was the center of the Industrial Revolution. Performances which ran for three to four weeks with full houses. You know, it was such, it was seen as such an amazing uh, new art form, very popular art form. And when we look at the way in which that art form has changed and how it's been co-opted by the elite and, um, you know, other, other art forms have actually become a lot more expensive. Now, obviously I've got an agenda here because I'm a big opera fan, but, you know, I'm just making a historical point as well. Um, but I think also, you know, things are not always what they seem. So, for example, so I, I, we have the impression, certainly in the English speaking world, we sometimes have the impression that some other cultures in Europe feel very defensive, feel very under attack. I mean, I can, I know why, because of the wave of, of American um, cinema and theatre and so on. But the, po the point is that Netflix, for example, has actually made a lot of European drama and European cinema much more readily available. So, for example, my partner who is Basque points out that, you know, there are many Spanish films and French films and so on now which are readily available um, to new audiences, which wouldn't have been before. It would have been, you would have had to go to your local art house cinema and there are not always many of them in certain cities see a Spanish film or a French film or something like that. But now you can very easily access it. So I'm just wondering, you know, in what way perhaps those new media are making European culture more readily available. So I think we have to be very fluid when we look at these situations. Thank you, Joseph, for uh, your comments there. Uh, I think that's very much the history of Europe uh, that you've described there. Uh, and it is by uh, or through the, uh, the development of popular culture that we have created uh, Europe. Think about uh, the birth of the German theater uh, through Strauss and Nietzsche who was promoting it because he said at the time uh, it was something that should replace the Italian opera. So I think what we need to do now is build something on a universal scale, uh, maybe more than a, a national one. If nobody else wishes to uh, take the floor or make a comment, I will give the floor to Eva for uh, presentation of our video if I'm not mistaken so we are going to um, so show this video and then we'll move on immediately to the third panel I won't uh, be moderating that third panel uh, and uh, I think uh, I'm just making sure that it works I don't know can we have the video please uh, and thank you for your attention everyone can we have the video, please? Yeah, shall I, shall I say a few words before we start? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for the European left to give us this opportunity. I mean, myself and the company which who produced this uh, video and also for a small subsidy towards making the video. Uh, it is for us sort of an emergency production. It came out of the... Um, 15 years of uh, attempts to dramatize a fragment novel by Jura Seufer, S-O-Y-E-R. He was a young um, Russian-born socialist, later turned communist dramatist, who wrote mi so-called middle plays, political plays, cabarets, um, political songs, a lot, a lot of poetry, essays for the workers' paper. We're talking the 20s and 30s in Vienna. And he was tragically um, killed, murdered in Buchenwald at the age of 26 in 1939. And um, 
he has been sort of a secret um, hero, sort of the Austrian Brecht for theatre people who are looking for political theatre with a popular touch. His plays are very, very funny. They're cabaret style, they're Brechtian, they use a, a distanced um, alienation effect, um, you know, dra dramatic mold. They have wonderful characters, typological characters. And in this novel, which is called Dust Tide, the party, and portrays the demise of the Austrian Social Democratic Party before the rise of fascism, and particularly Austro-fascism, uh, is, is, is a wonderful historic uh, document of uh, the political tensions of the time, the socio-cultural pol uh, polemics, the stagnation, the cultural, um, disbelief, uh, the um, neglect to look at the fascist danger, uh, the functionaries fighting each other and not uh, looking at what's going on in front of their own face, then the dissolvement of the, of the parliament. It follows certain historical events, but it fictionalizes them using some historical figures, even like Otto Bauer, who is one of the creators of Austro-Marxism. And this novel, disappeared because in exile many of, and first of all many uh, works of Jura Seufo were destroyed. He lived from 1912 to 1939 just to repeat this and his work has only been retraced after the war very very slowly and only recently and I think me and my company and other younger artists are part of this reappropriation. I used that word before in terms of who are our models? Who came before us? Who were the people that we can look towards to rejuvenate our political culture and particularly our political theater? So me and my company have worked for 15 years since 2006 on different versions of this novel, which is about 120 pages long. It should have probably become an epic but it was never finished. And some chapters, by the way, came to us back to Austria through London, uh, through exile. Uh, so we have only very few chapters of this novel and still it is considered the most important literary document of this era of Austrian history. So look at eight minutes we produced instead of a play, Corona uh, related, we couldn't perform this year. We have not been performing the whole year and everything we're doing is Zoom and um, producing small little videos. We're not a video company, we're not a film company. So please bear with the sort of experimental nature of it. It was filmed in June in a historic uh, Red Vienna housing project called the Werkbund Siedlung, which is a, UNESCO cultural heritage project of originally 70 houses for workers and actually lower middle class families with little gardens and they were all created by world renowned uh, architects, uh, Red Vienna avant-garde architects. So you'll get a little bit of a sense of this kind of endeavor. I, I, I wish you good, uh, yeah, good viewing. Thank you very much.
unsichtbar verwachsen. Das ist vielleicht auch kein Zufall, ein, botanische, äh, ein botanisches Wunder. Ähm, äh, Margarete Schütte-Lihotzky war eine Widerstandskämpferin, äh, ist auch in die Sowjetunion äh, abgewandert, später war Kommunistin, wird heute geehrt im, es gibt einen Schütte-Lihotzky-Raum in der Freiheit im dritten Wiener Gemeindebezirk, wo ja heute posthum wie so vielen in Österreich gehört ist. Wird. Stimmt das hier in der Siedlung? Ist sie die einzige Architektin gewesen? Es ist die einzige Frau, selbstverständlich, ja. Ja, 1932 ist ja das auch eine kleine Sensation eigentlich. Menschen sind wir einst vielleicht gewesen oder werden es eines Tages sein, wenn wir gründlich von all dem genesen. Aber sind wir heute Menschen? Nein, wir sind der Name auf dem Reiseplatz. Wir sind das stumme Bild im Spiegelglas. Wir sind das Echo eines Brasenschweiß und Widerhall des toten Widerhalls. Wir sind das Echo eines Brasenschweiß und Widerhall des toten Widerhalls. Die Welt befindet sich in einer Übergangsphase und ist darum qualvoller und widerspruchsvoller als jene Zwischenzeit es war. Der Kapitalismus steht in einer Krise von unerhörter Schärfe. Doch trotz alledem, die äußere Macht des Systems ist unerhört stark. Denn je größer die wirtschaftlichen Schwierigkeiten des Bürgertums werden, desto mehr wird die Last der Krise auf die Arbeiter abgewälzt, desto schwerer wird diese Last. Je tiefer die Zweifel des Bürgertums an der inneren Berechtigung seiner Herrschaft, desto brutaler werden seine rücksichtslosen Herrschaftsmittel. Ferdinand Vorschlag war Obmann der einer der mächtigsten Eisenbahnergruppen und hoher Bezirksfunktionär im Republikanischen Schutzbund. Er war seit zehn Jahren kein einziges Mal krank gewesen und im Spiegel pflegte er sich nur so lange zu besehen, als nötig ist, um zu wissen, ob man sich sauer gewaschen hat. Nichts gibt dem Betrieb Anlass zu bezweifeln, dass er die Autoritätsperson ist. Der Nationalrat Josef Dreher war nicht gerade das, was man eine durchgeistigte Erscheinung nennt, oder? Ah. Bebe, bebe. Ja, er sagt da was. Keine Dienstplanänderung, keine Lohnkürzung geht im Betrieb durch, ohne dass sie mir als Gewerkschaftsführer vorgelegt worden ist. Na no, also, Genosse Torschuk. Dass endlich da bist, ich warte schon Ewigkeit auf dich. Pferde. Pferde. Ich muss dir gratulieren. Deine Besonnenheit. Was hat Schlimmes verhindert? Hm. Was? Du willst schon nach Haus gehen? Wart noch ein bisschen. M müde, ja. Ja, kann ich mir denken. Ich begleite dich ein Stück. Also, das hätte ich mir nie gedacht. Mit deinen Leuten, mit deiner Verbissenheit, die anderen auseinandergetrieben haben. Na ja, sie werden Menschen noch ohne Fortmann. Der wird sich gleich erhaben fühlen über die Masse. Habe ich nicht recht, gell? <lacht> ja. 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 Du willst schon, schon gehen. Na, müde, müde, ja, ja. Verstehe ich. Verstehe ich. Ja, komm.
kommt dann so ein Einblendung. Ja, ich bitte noch ein Witz von der Torte. Thank you. You forgot the logos because it had the logo of Transform and of the European left. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if it made any sense for people who don't know the Austrian history and, and have no conception of the novel and everything. It's, it's a fragment of a fragment of a fragment. Thanks anyway. <laughs> I, I don't want to say anything now. Um, if you want to have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, there's a lot to say about the theater versions of this, which are all uh, an hour and a half. And there are songs, there are dialogues, monologues, choruses. Of course, this is not represented in this emergency production. But I was very proud that in spite of not being able to work, we could gather in this house very famous house by Adolf Loos, one of the most famous architects of the turn of the century, meaning 1900 to 1930, whatever, nine. And um, yeah, we, we just filmed some of the scenes there together. We had a sort of a yeah community meeting with cooking and shooting and rehearsing and spending time together. And I, and, and I thought that was a, a rather pleasant experience, community type experience. Yeah. to share with you uh, the next panel. I'm Per Almeda, the director of a Catalan think tank on contemporary issues, and I'm going to moderate this third panel on the migration policy crisis and the growing influence of the far right. Uh, the question is why the culture is essential. Uh, we all know that we are living on multiple crises and uh, we are living uh, these crises which are the fuel for populism and extremism and the right and, and the extreme right and fascism. National populism bolsters fears and flags up scapegoats with racism and xenophobia. The scapegoats against immigration and against other political cultures that are different. We have seen it all over Europe. And now we are suffering the race of fascist parties on many European countries. And now we are also seeing the decline of democracy in many parts of the world. A regression that is leading to the erosion of fundamental rights and civil and political freedoms under authoritarian forms authoritarian forms of power that are opposed to pluralism and tolerance in many regressive ways that threatens the democratic advances achieved in the preceding decades. The raising of authoritarianism uh, affects the most vulnerable people and hides the real causes of the crisis, inequalities and the crisis of capitalism. In this context, the culture is a fundamental right and also, let me say, a fundamental tool and weapon to fight against fascism. In order to discuss in this panel of the importance of culture for uh, the, the strengthen of a democratic culture, 
we're going to have uh, three panelists that I'm going to introduce. The first speaker is the acclaimed the young Greek actor, Ominos Poulakis, who is going to treat the topic, can art and culture play a significant part against fascism, racism, racism and the far right rhetorics? If so, how this can be realized? What artists can do in order to effectively join this struggle? Omidius is going to speak now. The floor is yours, Omidius. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I wish you the best, everyone, because we're facing harsh times. So we want to focus on culture, because culture can be used to face fascism, uh, violence. So I'm asking myself many questions, actually. So what is the definition of culture? You know, it is hard to define culture. It makes our work more complex. In society today, we see that culture is not something material. It's abstract. It's quite intellectual. And so for our discussion on culture, I would like to define culture as a way to receive or to create arts, artworks, intellectual works. I'm not going to speak about different technical works that people could perform uh, when they have done studies in the field of culture. Now, it's not about politeness either. It's not about feelings. Culture, I see culture as a way to produce art, to consume art, okay? Like theater, a book. This is a way, something you can use and consume for, for far right and fascism. Those people who promote hatred, well, what I see, clearly see, is uh, the following. The far right wing tend to use an argument to push forward their ideas. They want to fight against what is different. They want to destroy what's different from them even different types of human behaviors. They are fighting against that. And all this relies on fear, fear of others, of strangers, of foreigners. And this fear creates hatred. It creates hatred. And because of hatred, people will attack those they don't know. This is the very basics of fascism. This is something we see in people's attitude towards minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities. Now, when it comes to culture, about creating, consum consuming artworks, cultural works, uh, well, I can say the following, I'm an actor, so I will share my experience. And I, I, I'm a consumer. I consume art, artwork, because this is what I like. And and in my case, and in others' case too, we see that culture develops a person's capacity to understand that things can be different. It helps them be open-minded to difference. Every artistic work is based on a different view. So every time you meet an artwork, well, you see that culture intervenes and it brings you something new. So one can say that culture can open up a, a person's personality. It can broaden your personality. And so culture will allow you to broaden your horizon. Uh, culture is... Uh, it's like something very broad, something you can surf on, like the sea. When fascism, it's like a knife. 
a knife that is there to destroy things. So we need to stick together to break the knife of fascism. And in Greece, there is no such thing as culture education. So all this is absent. And so had we had culture initiation lessons, maybe would have rejected less other people or uh, strangers, you know, because culture provides a structure. It's linked to education, actually. And society needs to pay more attention to artworks and to culture. And in doing so, we could create this new C that we need. And then we face this knife, which comes from hatred and far right. And little by little, we could try to shape the knife differently with the power of the sea. So this knife actually represents the far right and it cannot hurt the sea. You can hit the sea with a knife, but it's pointless. So this is the message I wanted to send across. Thank you for your attention. Let me take out the interpretation. Okay, uh, the second speaker is the activist Freddy Boucher, one of the coordinators of the March des Immigrants, the March of the Migrants, who is going to intervene on how art can play a shooting and supporting part while dealing with trauma and extremely difficult or painful experiences and living conditions of refugees and migrants. Uh, Freddy, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. You can turn your microphone on. Voilà. Voilà. OK, vous m'entendez? All right, thank you. Donc, uh, voilà. Bonsoir à tout le monde. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm the coordinator of an association called the March of Migrants. But I'm also a member of another association, which is the association to defend uh, people enjoying social benefits. So the March of the Migrants is an association to defend the individual and collective rights of migrant people and persons. And the other association supports people uh, and their rights, those who face the most precarious situations in Belgium. That's the people who are on social benefit. So they get a uh, state, uh, uh, like a state benefit. That's a minimum wage, so to speak, not even, but that's people who get this benefit because they're not able to work and have an income. So I've been working on this for around 20 years. So we've been working to listen, to be able to give them a say, you know, these migrants, people working or living in the margin, these people have become invisible in society. And for now 20 years, we've been using culture. We've been using culture to the purpose to make it easier for uh, these people to actually be heard. So we work in a city with 85,000 people that was built around the local steel industry and the unemployment rate before the COVID crisis was around 20%. Now for 20 years, we've been building places, venues for these people to meet, to speak, but also to open 
their hearts and speak freely because as it was previously said by the two people actually tonight already, but as it was said, when it comes to migra migration policies, but also social policies, well, these policies now are about repression. They're about uh, repression against these people. And the institutions dealing with migration, but also social benefit. These institutions are imposing a lot of constraints to these people nowadays. So for us, it is particularly important to create venues where people can meet and speak freely, places where they can be heard uh, without being judged uh, for what they say and uh, who they are. And in our work, we always wanted to start from the reality experienced by these persons on the field. We wanted to use their reality to develop our expertise and our analysis. And it was our fundamentals to actually uh, design uh, our uh, demand. So our starting ground is the, these people's experience and lives. So very soon in our work, we try to use um, writing workshops, literary workshops, and we use to work with uh, cultural workers, especially uh, local uh, theater companies, those who do action theater, we call it. Their purpose is to provide theater, uh, access to theater to all. And now for around 20 years, we've had these venues for people to speak freely. And thanks to those workshops, I insist 20 years, well, these, with these workshops, we've been able to design projects. And this has led to the publishing of books. Uh, we've published or made plays, etc. All this is based on the experience of these people living precarious lives. So these are writing workshops. These have enabled us to activate those people, so to speak, of course, that's to give them a way to be heard and speak. In Belgium, there was a major struggle by the paperless, um, paperless migrants. They occupied uh, many places. In 2009, there was a massive regularization uh, process in Belgium, so the, many people, uh, paperless people, illegal people received papers, but not everybody's involved at the same level. So there are people who lead, they take the lead. And thanks to that, to, thanks to our work, those people who were not leaders could get more involved. They could also be heard, although they were not leaders. So we have worked with a series of people, they occupied churches even in Belgium, and together uh, we were uh, uh, working uh, on different uh, projects that would be useful for the greater public. So we've had people in precarious situations, and we try to make sure that as many people as possible can get organized and can get involved and actually can speak freely in public. And we need tools like that. And, well, actually many people are involved, but they would not be so active without those workshops. And there's the last project that we did was a bit different we had uh, the possibility to open writing workshops in different uh, uh, environments like uh, women's uh, groups. We worked with associations where they teach people to read and write. We work with an association uh, working with the homeless. We um, listen to the testimonies of asylum seekers, illegal migrants, and all those testimonials uh, uh, were gathered in a book and we also created a, a play 
a play uh, whose translation would be this happened too many times. And we made sure that migrants would meet people uh, living precarious lives, uh, people facing many hardships, and these people met. Pe these people from different backgrounds met and we'll see how they can speak about their own reality and share a common project. And thanks to that, they can go beyond some preconceived ideas that they have about each other. So this is the method that we use. This is the struggle that we do to fight racism in popular uh, layers of a society and to fight far right wing parties, which do the opposite. They're trying to divide people based on hatred. Now, in the framework of this project, we saw that people have changed their minds, you know, about people living in precariousness and uh, about uh, the image they had about migrants, you know, their understanding of what migrants would like, look like. And finally, I would like to say the following. We're in the Alpha project before we started the um, uh, workshop, we worked a lot to provide explanations to explain how social policies have evolved and how migration policies have evolved too. So we worked on this with a group of people and this group has also evolved a lot, especially when they started the writing workshops. This actually enabled us to bring more momentum. So these people facing difficulties, these people who had a hard time reading and writing, when they said that to actually fight social injustice, they would create their own movement. And so they create their own, created their own movement, uh, whose name is the Fighters for Change, for more social justice. They have their own logo now. And with this group, well, the project is not ended. You know, the, it keeps going on. And it's still uh, about the fight against racism and to make sure that uh, people's rights are respected, to make sure that people would live a decent life. And beyond this project, these people remain active. They have set the, own, the features of their own project. They created their own exhibition with pictures about precariousness. They now want to create their own uh, theater play with the support of a, uh, an action theater uh, company. And the theme is precariousness, okay? So today we're somehow stuck. Now we, we really rely on the cultural sector to carry out those actions. And we're facing a, a, a strange period of time, a strange era rather, because we're stuck. Now, unfortunately, the interpreter doesn't hear anything. Sorry for that. All right, the sound is back. These uh, have let, well, the, the purpose is to uh, make sure that everybody hears about the situation of these people facing precariousness. And this will help everyone have a debate and it will uh, allow many people to understand the reality of migrants. And uh, this is our goal today. Now the cultural sector is blocked in Belgium. And so the show that cre we created is, well, we cannot do anything at the moment. So 
we've been working with the Alpha Group, and with this Alpha Group, we've we, we've managed to find a way to keep working. So we're facing uh, also a digital divide. You know, there's a digital gap, but to try to keep meeting on Zoom, and we move on with the project alongside with them. I'll stop now. Uh, thank you for your attention. I think you have understood what I meant to say about the role of the cultural sector because it can play an important role when it comes to fighting against the far right. It is very useful to give power to migrants and people facing precariousness. And these people can also contribute to the struggle to make sure they can enjoy decent life. up in Greece. His perspective focuses on whether how art and culture of migrants, refugees can help them in their constructive coexistence and social interaction with their new residents, and whether their cultural tradition can be a significant part of a new uh, European cultural identity. And finally, as an artist himself, growing up and creating his own identity in his new residence, does he use his cultural tradition as a key element or not? Enke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Kalispera se olus. Sas ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ε, να διορθώσω μόνο κάτι. Δεν είμαι διευθυντής, είμαι σκηνοθέτης ηθοποιός. Θέλω να κάνω and thank you for giving me the floor. Indeed, I am uh, here in Greece and I uh, have listened uh, carefully to what has been said uh, uh, this evening. I arrived in Greece in 1993. I think I was 12 at the time. Uh, I was what you call now an economic migrant and I'm not going to tell you anything about the racism uh, that uh, did exist at the time, uh, you know, when you would come from the former communist uh, bloc, I would say, uh, and moving to Greece. Um, so uh, I won't talk about this. I will focus more on uh, other aspects. We're here uh, in a forum of the European left. And I think uh, it's interesting maybe to think about what uh, Eastern Europe used to be at the time of, uh, let's say, under the communist regime. Uh, culture was an important dimension of life there. Art and culture did have uh, a major role to play. Uh, but I, okay, I'll stop there. Now, when you're a migrant in, in, in Greece, uh, you're something new because, uh, it's probably only after the year 2000 that we've seen people arriving in Greece uh, um, and those migrants then started uh, being, I would say, uh, integrated into uh, society and into the culture. Now we still have, of course, a, a migration uh, phenomenon taking place and affecting Greece very much. Uh, uh, I am Greek, of course, now. Uh, I am quite happy uh, that Syriza, when it came to power, uh, granted uh, Greek citizenship to uh, second generation uh, uh, children, uh, migrant children. And uh, I think back to the topic here, uh, how to integrate maybe uh, migrants into uh, the Greek society. I must say this is a long process. I have not myself as an artist uh, been faced with racism directly but trying to absorb uh, the history of migrants and uh, uh, what, what migrants have gone through into Greek culture is extremely complicated. Uh, refugees or migrants uh, are uh, the subject now of culture somehow and uh, works of art focus on them but as far 
as uh, the national policy is concerned, for example, the national theater policy uh, is still totally closed uh, to uh, migrants. There's nobody uh, who is a migrant that's uh, holding any major position there. We've never seen there in those big institutions uh, any migrant being given a chance, uh, even in, I would say, smaller size uh, or cultural uh, institutions, uh, even those that have been established by the left. Uh, we've got very few migrants there. I think uh, Albanians are maybe the first, uh, the most numerous uh, uh, population or, or, or in Greece, we're about a, a million point two or point three. Uh, we are quite, you know, uh, numerous. We don't have anyone representing us in parliament, for example, uh, nor in the uh, public administration, public services. So um, integrating migrants in, in Greece is an extremely complicated process. In 2013, we were able to um, uh, organize through public funding from Europe a project uh, which was a joint project involving both Greeks uh, and uh, migrants. Uh, so we worked on the basis, uh, and I'm not going to say anything here about the wages that were paid, but uh, we were able to finance this event uh, and this project uh, thanks to a financial contribution from the EU. But that particular show and uh, was extremely uh, affected, negatively affected by uh, uh, the fact that at the time the Golden Dawn movement was extremely powerful. Uh, uh, there were um, at the time also a lot of people who were struggling to survive in Greece. Uh, lots of Greeks had lost their income at the time. So this was the wrong time maybe to uh, uh, put up a show and hope that it would uh, attract a lot of attention. It went relatively, um, it stayed relatively invisible, I would say. Now, when you look at the main uh, theatres here, the main institutions in the field of culture, the main theatre festivals, they haven't yet uh, succeeded uh, in uh, uh, integrating people you know, former migrants or, uh, and when anything is put up uh, that talks about migration, it's usually done not by migrants, but by Greeks uh, themselves. And when you invite uh, anybody, uh, uh, well, usually uh, actors uh, uh, remain very, very, uh, uh, I would say Greek, and I think we have lost this challenge of, of multicultural diversity here. As uh, a director, uh, in most of the movies that I direct, uh, I try to talk, of course, about migration, about Albania, about uh, even if I work on, on Greek uh, authors' work or Garcia Lorca or others, I try to inject into the works uh, my past uh, uh, as an Albanian uh, by uh, giving a chance to Albanian actors or by uh, adding a, an Albanian you know dimension to uh, to the work so I think that's my contribution I'm trying to share my Albanian heritage and uh, uh, inject that into other uh, Western European uh, works of art I've done it uh, in, in several shows, several movies. Uh, I remember uh, doing uh, one play which would finish with uh, an Albanian uh, song. Uh, I also worked on another project where uh, I tried to describe the reality of migrants, and specifically Albanian migrants. So I tried to combine both identities, my Albanian uh, and my Greek identities. And I'm trying to do that. Uh, but, but I'm quite pessimistic when I see what's happening in Europe, uh, when I see how 
European funding is, is distributed and shared. Well, uh, I think, you know, the part, uh, the amount of money that goes to uh, migrant people uh, is very, very limited. And I want to say this again, unfortunately, in this country and in many other countries, I think it's the same. Well, uh, in uh, theater in particular, there is very little space given to uh, uh, migrant communities. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that means we haven't given European citizens the ability to uh, uh, to have access to that and to see that reality, which is part of, of Europe today. So I'm trying to uh, uh, talk about various subjects here so that uh, we uh, can then have a discussion. I think the point of this is that we need in the future to uh, fight and uh, try to uh, make sure that our cultural identity becomes seen as migrants and uh, visible and, uh, uh, and to, to the rest of Europe. Sorry, we've got a bit of interference uh, here. And so I'm trying uh, systematically uh, to make sure that uh, this happens and that things change. We know uh, we have a lot, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, a lot more things to do. So I'll stop there and sorry, because we've had quite a lot of interferences in various languages here. It to the rest of the participants. So if you want to introduce uh, your ideas, your perspective or comment uh, the panelist intervention. Please raise your hand or open your microphone. Joseph, you can turn your, your microphone. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to um, direct my question primarily at Enke. Uh, from your experience as an Albanian and so on. I was, I was on a meeting this morning where people were discussing the situation in France, very serious developments in France where Macron is now going down the road towards Le Pen. I mean, actually virtually criminalizing the entire Muslim community in France. It's one of the most serious developments yet in Western Europe. And it's showing the classic um, you know, creating what they call in German Feindbild, the picture of an enemy by, you know, suggesting that Muslims and obviously many of the migrants are Muslims, suggesting that they are other, that they are danger and so on. We know where it's coming from, but it's actually playing the song, playing the tune of the far right. What you said is very interesting that in Greece there's been very little space given to migrant communities to present an image of themselves. Don't you think now it's absolutely urgent of the first magnitude for anybody in the European left, wherever in Europe, to try and put on and support um, artistic presentations which will demonstrate that migrants are not the other, are not the enemy. I mean, this, this has now become really important, hasn't it? Ε, ναι, ε, είναι, τρομακτικό, είναι τρομακτικό αυτό που συμβαίνει στη Γαλλία. Εγώ θα, θα έπρεπε να δυναμώσουμε τη φωνή μας και... Uh, uh, ...frightening. And what you just described is also uh, scary. I think what we need to do is indeed show uh, a different reality. Maybe writers, directors, uh, actors, singers, I mean, anybody uh, who is into culture should, you know, have the ability to, to show things uh, maybe with a different perspective. I know that, okay, we've got the COVID-19 uh, crisis and, uh, uh, you know, in, in Hamlet, Shakespeare clearly shows that the solution can be found with actors. So maybe this is something we have to uh, do now. Uh, we are, as, as actors, as artists, uh, the solution. And maybe we, we must make ourselves heard. 
we've got this weapon, this fantastic weapon, internet. So let's use it. Uh, maybe we need to, I mean, if we need to fight, yes, well, uh, we need maybe to use that uh, weapon, uh, use the internet. And uh, uh, Lorca would travel from village to village to show his works. Uh, maybe, you know, given the current situation and the inability to, uh, to move, well, maybe we have to use the internet to move uh, from place to place and share uh, work and show what we do. I think this is maybe the only, you know, possibility that we have now. Uh, and, and maybe we can learn from the history of theatre and in a very specific context, of course, of, of COVID-19 now, uh, maybe we can uh, learn from the past and try to use that special time to uh, train people. Uh, Gorky, at the time of the October Revolution, wrote for the people. We are maybe uh, here in a more narcissistic uh, uh, situation. We have to wake up and tell the people that the people, uh, of course, it's incessant for the people to eat. Uh, it's essential to go to yeah supermarket. Why not? But uh, we also need to feed our brains and our minds and uh, find ways to uh, uh, you know learn and, and see foreign people and migrants not as, as as a threat but as well someone who's just like us, even though different from us. And I think with the current situation and the pandemic. Of course, nobody had anticipated this, but uh, well, let's be uh, brave. Uh, let's dare to go forward and let's, uh, and the left should uh, be united there. I think the, the right-wing uh, forces in Europe are uh, increasingly united. I think yeah, we need to do the same. And unfortunately, we're not united. I don't quite know whether I answered your question, to be honest, Joseph. against fascism and that we are very aware that fascism must be permanently fought. But on the street, there are thousands of people, maybe millions, <coughs> willing to sympathize with fascism. We, are, we have to be conscious about this, or at least on some aspects of fascism and extremism. Many of them are determined to vote fascist parties because they are, they are under the circumstances and the consequences of capitalism, and they are disenchanted and disaffected with democracy. Um, how can we introduce the values of respect, recognition, tolerance on different cultures of migrants and introduce anti-fascist narratives on the mainstream culture in order to arrive to the majority of the society. Because fascism is threatening our societies. It's become mainstream. Now they are governing in some European countries. So we have to use all the tools and culture is a very, very powerful tool. Enke was mentioning uh, Garcia Lorca back in the 1930s when he was going town to town to do theater and express their work. In Spain, uh, Vox, the fascist party, is the party that have more followers on the social networks. Um, so, we have to use social networks and cultural uh, artists, intellectuals, writers, all the people that work in culture have to use also social networks to introduce anti-fascist narratives. What do you think about this? Uh, we know that Vox in Spain uh, has millions of followers in social networks like TikTok, 
Instagram. So it's not enough going uh, village by village, but we have to use all the tools that are legitimate to fight against fascism. What are your ideas about this? Anyone want to share their views? Freddy. Euh, voilà, c'est sur par rapport au fait que la gauche devait s'unir. On uh, the need for the left to become more united uh, or truly united. Yes, I agree. But on uh, on a basis of, of something that is clear, that makes sense. And yes, if we talk about migration, migration policies, uh, I think. Uh, uh, or if I talk, about, as I did before, about precarious people, I think, unfortunately, here, we don't have enough clarity. Uh, and at least when I say the left, think about the left that was in power. I mean, look at the uh, Socialist uh, Party and uh, François Hollande when he was president uh, of France. I don't think he was very, very, uh, I mean, what he did was very, very positive. Uh, or, or, I mean, I don't think he helped the French people and the workers of the French people to uh, truly think differently. Uh, I don't think he raised the awareness of uh, um, about you know the need to see migrant people as uh, not as a threat, uh, but as people who have rights. The same is happening here. The Socialist Party here in Belgium uh, has just decided to join the government uh, and that government is very much a right-wing government. It's dominated by the right wing and is going to continue implementing the same uh, migration policy uh, that was implemented by the previous government. Uh, and at the time, the minister in charge of migration was uh, a member of the NVA, uh, extreme right uh, wing uh, uh, party. So I think when we say let's unite as the left, okay, but then we need some sort of reorganization to take place of who is the left and who uh, really should be part of the left. And uh, when you look at uh, the current policies in Belgium, uh, uh, particularly the, the social policies uh, are associated with increasingly strict constraints and criteria. If you are uh, unemployed, uh, if you want to have access to social benefits and some sort of social support, it's increasingly complicated. We think that the social security system should help people, but indeed what it does is exclude people, and uh, particularly the most vulnerable and precarious are the first affected by that. In a country like Belgium, uh, uh, all those uh, measures and all those, uh, I would say, policies have been very much often uh, carried out by socialist ministers. So I think I agree. Yes, we need to be more united, but we also need uh, uh, to make sure that it happens on the basis of, of the right choices and the right orientations. And if we don't do that, uh, well, I don't quite see how we can change much, really. And particularly if we are talking about changing people's attitude and mental attitude, uh, well, I don't think how we can do that if we don't have that united left, but on the right basis. Thank you, Freddy. We still have uh, two or three more minutes for the debate before we uh, see the last video. Enke, you want to uh, say something? The floor is yours. Ne, θέλω να προσθέσω κάτι και καταρχήν αυτό που είπε ο Φρέντι. Thank you. Just an addition, maybe. I think what Freddy just said. Uh, so when he talked about uh, 
you know, those ministers that uh, are members of a, a particular government and, and are sometimes in charge of migration and an extreme right. It's exactly the same thing here. Uh, we have here in Greece, uh, well, extreme right ministers in charge of migration policies. So uh, this is a step backwards. Uh, and when we say, uh, uh, okay, fascism is a problem and we need to fight it and maybe we need to use social media to deal with it. Uh, like you said about Vox, yes, I agree. But I think fascism has roots that go much deeper than, uh, you know, the very superficial uh, social network. So I think we can fight fascism on the net, yes, but we need uh, to also show uh, societies, our societies, that culture is an essential element in our lives. You know, people think that when you work in culture, it, it's it's nice. You have a you have a hobby and you're having fun. Uh, I think we have to say that uh, it's not like that. We have here uh, an infectiologist or uh, uh, one of those experts who said uh, to uh, Mitsotakis, our prime minister, that uh, uh, culture is not essential at all and that uh, it doesn't really matter and that uh, there are more important aspects in the context of a pandemic. So again, it shows that uh, we're not important and also we are seen as always being uh, left-wing and that uh, of course is a problem to some government. So my point is let's get closer to the people. Uh, art has to be something that uh, belongs to the people, uh, not just to some rich people who uh, enjoy their villas and swimming pools. So I think we have to go back to the roots of what culture is supposed to be, something that uh, belongs to uh, uh, normal people and particularly uh, migrant people. Uh, I'm always very emotional when I think about the Russian artists who've always been, uh, you know, forced to run away uh, uh, and to go and live abroad uh, to find some sort of you know, peace uh, of mind. I think we need to find ways uh, today to uh, mobilize ourselves, to, to help migrants. Uh, I heard about the 2% earlier, it's one way of maybe doing that, but I think we need to mobilize and do something because it's going to be extremely hard to go, you know, back to normal uh, after, even just going back to normal would be difficult after the crisis. And I think people are being manipulated increasingly uh, by fake news, by uh, all sorts of uh, uh, information shared and, and, and fake news and fake information, disinformation shared by uh, by media, it's probably why Vox has millions of followers, you know, it's propaganda, pure and simple. So I think uh, we uh, don't even have a space in the media uh, to speak up and to be heard. Uh, and we need to first gain those spaces and then yes, we can start, you know, saying what needs to be said. And uh, I don't expect too much from uh, politicians because I don't think they are very much willing to help us and here in Greece at least this is where I live artists are not essentials essential sorry and that's it the doctor yes is essential uh, and so who else is important people working in supermarkets and delivery guys you know these are essential workers apparently according to our government so day long if your TV is on, you will be seeing that these people are essential, but we are not. Uh, and that is a danger for all of us. And I think the left has to do something about it. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, well, regain that lost space. Thank you. And uh, thank you for well, giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Jenke, for your uh, very interesting uh, thoughts. Um, 
probably now it's more uh, true than ever the idea of uh, that uh, Naomi Klein expressed on the doctrine of shock that in these times of extremely difficult times we cannot accept power saying what uh, it's important or it's not probably culture it's one of the most important ways to fight against extremism against racism culture literature music and art are the best expressions to promote intercultural dialogue and understand between different peoples that are part of the same humanity. So we've, we have come at the end of this debate. I want to thank uh, everyone participating on this third panel and all of this conference this afternoon. Uh, before we close and I pass the floor to Margarita to see the video, I want to thank all the organizers that made possible this uh, Zoom meeting between different people worried about uh, the situation of today's uh, uh, culture in, in, in Europe. Also, I would like to thank uh, Daniel and Joseph and, and everyone and Jean-Pierre and also the interpreters for their work. Uh, thanks everyone. It, it's been a very interesting debate and I hope we can continue uh, debating and dialoguing with uh, people across Europe about these important issues. So, uh, Margarita, the floor is yours and thanks everyone. We're going to close after the video. Thanks everyone. Well, it is a coincidence, but this song is, uh, has a lot to do about, uh, with um, uh, the last conversation. It is um, a traditional song called Thalasaki, which uh, means uh, the little sea. It's about, uh, this, uh, it, it's a girl singing to the sea, saying about the sailors that go away and uh, to the other countries to make a living and, you know, as uh, uh, parts of the Navy, uh, to be kind with them and not, uh, um, put them in danger. This is a uh, one a concert we had this summer, one of the few we uh, managed to have. And I would like to 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 say one word, uh, two words actually. Uh, one is that uh, the audience was very happy. They were like, "Okay, we're so happy that we can actually watch again li a live concert." That means that uh, art is not in danger. Um, I mean, people will need it. People already need it. And we have to make our best to be present. We have to make our best to persuade the governments not to uh, find an easy enemy to um, uh, culture and uh, make it happen, make it be a part of life. It is as important as the supermarket, as the um, hospitals, and as everything else. Uh, you will f see uh, an interesting instrument in this video. It is an ancient lyre. Uh, this is a, a new instrument based on, uh, uh, you know, the, all the ancient uh, sources. And you can hear it, how it used to sound in ancient Greek, and we renovate the sound of the lyre through this group that you're going to hear now. Good night, everybody. Je voudrais juste rajouter aussi un petit merci à tout le monde. Et, I would like uh, to thank you, everyone. To thank everyone, including the interpreters working backstage and the different speakers. I have a message from Jean-Pierre who could not speak tonight, but he sent me a small message. He would like to thank you all for what you said tonight. We'll try to uh, draw some conclusions from this meeting to go on with our future work and actions. So we'll try to do something concrete to make sure that people understand that culture is a vital, essential, and shared good. And there is no Europe without culture. So keep in touch, stay connected, stay tuned. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, uh, have a nice evening and enjoy the video.